as this new drug SFO came, we added it three times a day. And then also had to tell him he used to is eating very well. At least I have seen him every dialysis. He has three double decker cheese sandwiches, which I had to tell him to cut down. And uh, serum phosphorus level came down with these two intervention to a reasonable level. And let's see what happens next month. As opposed to that, this is another 40 year old female chronic glomerulonephritis, uh, has PKD with EGFR of 20 ml per minute. Serum phosphorus is 6.5 in spite of calcium acetate 2001 milligram per day and sevalamar carbonate. Uh, she is dietary compliant, so she is changed from sevalamar to sucrophoric oxyhydroxide, 50 nitrate milligram, and serum phosphorus is brought under control. I'm sure these are some of the typical case scenarios which uh, all of us have faced in our day-to-day uh, -day practice. And then this is third patient, 50-year-old male who's newly detected CKD due to diabetic kidney disease. As usual, many of them do get detected late in the day and has normal calcium, but phosphorus is on the higher side. So then the question arises, what phosphate binder should be started? And then in this particular case, we decided to start with SFO mm -hmm. and uh, serum phosphorus level reduced to normal. So these are the three case scenarios with that. Uh, let me start with the first question. Dr. Sonal Dalal, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Yeah, hi. So this hi. was discussed uh, towards the end uh, of the uh, talk uh, in the question answer about Dr. Floor. And uh, this has always been a question. I mean, many a times uh, we have seen this. And in fact, uh, uh, abdominal aortic calcification was one of the trial conducted in India at multi-center level. And we did find uh, uh, evidence of calcification in a lateral film of the abdomen over the aorta. And uh, this was present even at the time when the CKD was diagnosed. So if the cal vascular calcification is already pre-existing, does control of phosphorus uh, have any mortality benefit? And, or is it a very true sentence or not really so? No, definitely it is a true sentence because hyperphosphatemia per se will increase the uh, like uh, endothelial uh, increased calcium uptake and because of that calcification is going to increase and uh, the effect on FGF23 also is increased. So uh, controlling hypercalcemia would definitely uh, reduce the mortality and uh, as we discussed with uh, uh, doctor that there is a planned RCT on different phosphate binders. So let's have some, uh, maybe we have some better uh, output from this studies if they are conducted in future. Okay. And any other panelists can also join in uh, with these questions are not necessarily restricted to one uh, panelist at a time. So anybody would like to differ from what Dr. Sonal Dalal has said? I think what I would like to add is that hyperphosphatemia yeah. Uh, has been shown to be uh, associated with mortality and the calcification, cardiovascular, uh, cardiovascular disorders is the commonest reason for mortality and morbidity in our patients. Mm. Now, whether the phosphate binders are actually reducing that or not, we are not sure, but at least what evidence we have is that for controlling phos uh, increasing phosphorus is related to mortality. So currently from what we have, we will have to practice to make efforts to at least bring down the phosphorus levels with whatever efforts we have and uh, we have to look at our options. Yeah, exactly. So as, as, as Dr. Floch pointed out, yes, it also depends on the patient's age. You know, like as he said, rightly so, if you have a 70, 80 year old patient, you may not be so keen to, you know, restrict his diet. But in a patient whom I presented like 30 year old, obviously you will have to be very aggressive to control his phosphor, uh, phosphatemia. Right? So thank you, Dr. Sonal Dalal. We'll move to the next question. Uh, that uh, Tarun? Yeah, are there? yeah. So what are the current challenges and unmet medical needs in the management of CKD and BD patient in your clinical practice? Okay. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Mehta for this question. And I think... Uh, uh, most of the challenges were uh, enumerated by Dr. Floj as well as the 
discussions which went after his talk, but I would like to re-enumerate them. So one of the major challenge in my and in all patients is non-adherence to phosphate binders, which Dr. Floyd also mentioned. And this was uh, highlighted in one of our published study also that out of all the medicines, including the blood pressure medicines, the EPOs, the irons and all, phosphate binders uh, are the most commonly missed out medicines for different reasons which Dr. Floyd also mentioned. The non-availability of potent phosphate binders. Uh, before SFO, if you recall, the cevalomer carbonate, which is the commonest used uh, phosphate binder, the pill burden is anywhere between 6 to 12. And what he mentioned is out of 19 pills, 50% are phosphate binders. So, so less frequent monitoring of parathyroid hormone in our, especially Dallas patients, I don't see patients getting their PTH monitored every six monthly or three monthly, even if they are abnormal and even if there are recommendations by the nephrologist. They don't take, take it very seriously. This is another challenge. Then, as you also mentioned during discussion, that many of our patients have low serum calcium um, in our patients. So whether to use calcium-based phosphate binders or not is a question which is difficult to answer at this stage. And here I would like to mention, one of my students did a thesis where in hemodialysis patient, about 100 patients were uh, involved in the, that study. And about 81% patients were taking phosphate binders. And despite taking phosphate binders, about 21% did not have uh, phosphate in their target range. They were, they were having phosphates uh, above 5.5. And uh, to reiterate your question, corrected calcium below 8.6 was present in about 38%. I mean, we did not look below 7.5, but below 8.6 was 38%. So more than one, one third were uh, having calcium, calcium. below 8.6. Yeah. The PTH levels more than 300 were present in 43% and PTH less than 100 in only 10%, 9.3 to be exact. Mm -hmm. And there are evidences, if you see nowadays, there are several evidences even few years back, which showed worldwide that there is increase in low turnover bone disease in dialysis patients. And this has been proven by bone biopsy as well. And unfortunately, as has been discussed, inability of PTH to predict correctly whether it is low turnover or high turnover bone disease. What we usually do PTH to find out whether it's a high turnover bone disease. I would like to highlight one of the study which involved about 97 patients where bone biopsy was done. And all these 97 patients had PTH in the range of 150 to 300, which we usually target in dialysis patients. And surprisingly, out of these 97 patients, two third had low turnover bone disease where you would expect it to be at least high turnover because of the high PDH. But, yeah, but unfortunately, two third had... Yeah, but see, Tarun, yeah. I'll tell you something. Uh, I mean, if you see, as you said rightly, yes, PTH levels are not monitored, but without monitoring PTH levels, calcitriol is also started and continued. Which again is a, is a wrong practice. I, I Exactly. Think. But you know that, it as much as I know it, that calcitriol is started much earlier in CKD. Exactly. Dr. Mehta, we have a paper published for this also. And where I highlighted that physicians themselves, even before the patients are referred to the nephrologist, they're already started on calcium and phosphate bind, uh, sorry, calcitriol and the combination of both. So th when they come to us, probably their PTH is anyway suppressed. So yeah. car to carry on, the, again, already highlighted by Dr. Sunal Dalal that no undisputed uh, survival benefit with correction of any of these uh, minerals, calcium, phosphorus, or PTH. Unfortunately, we do not have undisputed survival benefits. Yeah. So as far as medical needs are concerned in CKD MBD, we have a new molecule which we discussed, which looks like it is more potent because the pill burden reduces by almost one third as compared to Sevlamar. And here briefly in less than 30 seconds, I would uh, highlight uh, my experience of 25 patients. So indications of switching over or adding SFO was 15, 56% phosphate was uncontrolled, which means it was more than 5.5. And in 28%, the pill burden was huge. And that is why they were shifted. Mean phosphate at baseline in all these 25 patients together was 6.3 and after three months was four and the mean change in phosphate was minus 1.35. So mm. this is my experience of 25 patients who were put on sucrose oxyhydroxide. So these are some challenges. I mean, there are many more challenges which actually can have a half an hour debate. And then uh, as far as the uh, needs are concerned, we need better studies to document survival benefit, which unfortunately we do not have. Thank you, Tarun.
uh, we'll move to the next question and maybe one of this point which you raised about uh, pill burden will be addressed to in uh, subsequent question. Uh, so let's move to the next question. Sharad, are you there? Hello? Dr. Sharad, yes, sir. Sharad? Uh, yeah, sir, uh, sir is there. Is it? Can you unmute yourself? Sharad? Hello? Okay. Can we go to the next question? Yadav? Yes, sir. Can you can you I call up Dr. Sharad to um, unmute his, himself in the meantime? Sure, I'll sure. take the next question. Uh, Perfect. And sir. I will Perfect. come back to him. So, Perfect. Ashwini, are you there? Dr. Ashwini Kumar? Yes, I am here. Yeah, hi. Yeah. So, what do you think about the advantages of SFO over currently available phosphate binders such as Civil Amar? I mean, except, of course, everybody is talking about. Uh, less pill burden but uh, beyond that uh, do you see any uh, other advantage where we should switch over all the patients from civil MR to SFO? I think anecdotally uh, what I have realized is uh, uh, just from a very small number of patients is that those who actually had a higher pill burden and then mm -hmm. were switched uh, over to uh, sucroferic uh, oxyhydroxide um, their phosphates were much better and uh, faster controlled. So I think potency-wise, they are probably better than uh, Sevlamar. Uh, not only in terms of pill-to-pill, uh, -pill, but also uh, in terms of uh, actual potency. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is one. And the second is actual, uh, actually the fact that it does not give IM uh, may actually be an advantage because there are a subset of patients where... Uh, uh, you are unable to give IVIN and they are IN or they are IN replete and you don't want to give IVIN and um, uh, you are unable to use Sevlamer and then you are left with uh, and they may also be calcium replete. So uh, uh, these are the subset of patients where the, the ability or the fact that it does not give IN may actually become an advantage. So uh, those are the subsets where um, sucroferic oxyhydroxide would actually score over. So I think these are the two biggest uh, advantages. And what the papers uh, uh, tell us is that it uh, works over a wide pH range. Hopefully that is a uh, greater advantage, but uh, I don't know how it uh, translates into clinical benefit, but uh, these are the two biggest benefits that I can see. So I was reading one of the previous papers of Dr. Flo, which where he has given a very nice uh, correlation of uh, amount of phosphate binding per pill, which is 130 milligram of phosphate. So if you take three tablets a day, you bind 390 milligram. And if you... Which is half the... Yeah. Okay. And if you add it over a week, it is exactly the half, of, I mean, the remaining part of whatever your dietary intake is minus whatever is removed on dialysis, which is 2,400 milligram. It over uh, four hours, three times a week dialysis. So that uh, they, we probably think it's a strong uh, phosphate binder compared to I other know. phosphate binders. And uh, maybe that's advantage that less pills and more uh, binding. So Sharad, are you there? Sharad? No? I Hello? think, sir, uh, he's facing problem with this mic. Okay, okay, okay. We'll we'll come back to him, or we will ask this question to any of the uh, Dr. Sure. Prakash Darji. Hello, Prakash. Can the MQR people just ensure that the next speaker is available to? All the panelists are available. Yeah, uh, yeah. So just uh, kind of just make them uh, available. Yeah. Okay. Let's. Emil, you can address this question. So, uh, is it a cost-effective alternative to Similar, which you are talking about, or uh, we should be looking at uh, other advantages uh, of this? Uh, as you 
this was pointed out in the earlier question and answer session that uh, most of the sfo studies are in the dialysis population but uh, what about pre dialysis if you think that is uh, also cost effective and less pill burden and that's why there is a, a better way to use this molecule over the pre existing one so i think we'll tell uh, in when I, when i talk about cost effectiveness we always i'll think about it in two ways one is whether it is effectively bringing down the phosphorus and of course the perceived mortality with it then in that situation uh, it will be really cost effective and second is the direct cost uh, in terms of the monthly amount paid off now in my personal experience since uh, this drug was introduced about 6 8 months back um, it, i first started using it as an add on and i found that uh, at least the phosphorus level started coming down then thereafter i started using it de novo and uh, i all the studies that i read the literature that i have read about it is that they are claiming it to be half the pill burden of uh, the other uh, uh, phosphate binders so in that situation uh, there seems to be some cost benefit in terms of the number of pills used now the actual cost Uh, and i thank eman mehta for uh, sharing this uh, data with me uh, the cost of this medicine itself is cheaper than a uh, standard 800 mg uh, uh, 7mr carbonate and as a result of that if you are able to give give the same effect in half the number of pills and the drug is cheaper then it would definitely bring about some cost effectiveness so i think one that i found it effective and second i think the cost at least perception is number of pills are less and therefore it will be effective thank you himal uh, we'll go to the next question so let's see who's there apurva are you there hello no no sir i can't see why don't you contact all of them mohan you are there right hello yeah yes sir ha uh, mohan hi so you have hello. calcium based phosphate binders non calcium based phosphate binders uh, iron based phosphate binders so we are now spoiled for a choice okay so what's your choice when you want to start a phosphate binder say uh, as i mentioned in my earlier three case uh, representative cases newly diagnosed ckd advancing ckd spore pre dialysis stage and ckd5 on hemodialysis so all these three situations what will so one one uh, choice for each one of them yeah looking at the question and the case scenarios what you have discussed with uh, us and the uh, dr floch has discussed uh, so many data with us uh, this is a very uh, sometimes uh, we have to uh, individualize the treatment it is not the uh, straight way to answer the question we using either calcium non calcium or iron based but to start with we have to uh, uh, assure our patients about the diet restriction as well as the uh, i am going with phosphate binder simultaneously uh, though our patients have some nutritional abnormalities as well so uh, uh, so moderate or low restriction of phosphate is also important along with the phosphate binder and if we see the efficacy of all this phosphate binder in most of the studies all are having good efficacy the problem is with the pill burden and that is the most important uh, part uh, when we consider the compliance in the long term so if we see the iron based phosphate binders they are quite effective with uh, less number of the uh, the pill burden is less and uh, uh, if we see efficacy wise uh, they are quite uh, uh, good as compared to the calcium uh, phosph uh, based phosphate binders but at to start with we have to see the calcium level phosphorus and the pth level as well and uh, depending on the uh, uh, this pth level uh, I, i may use the calcium based phosphate binders if the pth levels are too high and the uh, calcium is uh, maybe Uh, low or moderately low but if the calcium is okay then i think straight away going to the iron based phosphate binders is also a good option uh, looking at the pill burden and the good compliance in the long run so thank you amon so come uh, this is a question uh, coming uh, from the statement made by dr floor uh, and any any panelist can answer so you uh, he said that he doesn't bother about calcium unless it is less than 77.5 i mean are you all 
okay with that sort of a sentence uh, statement or no we are really worried even at uh, calcium corrected calcium of say 8 or say 7.9 or something like that anybody can answer tarun sonal anybody can answer looking uh, looking at the study what he showed he, the lowest calcium level also did not had any problems mm. but practically when you actually are in the field and practicing and you see calcium levels coming as 6 6.7 7 and you correct it it still remains below 7.5 mm. it becomes extremely difficult not to try to correct it and at that stage at least i am using calcium based phosphate binders for reasons like it can increase calcium it is cheaper and then more affordable uh, obviously if the calcium levels are more than 8 8.5 mm. then i tend to avoid uh, calcium based phosphate binders except for selected patient as dr mohan also mentioned you have to individualize if a patient is a poor patient i mean just because it's a calcium based phosphate binder not to use any phosphate binder and his phosphate remains 9 i don't see a rational so you yeah. have to individualize uh, yeah. such cases yeah and yes of course you are right tarun that you have to ultimately look at patient's finances also yeah. you can't uh, you know just tell him that i'll give you survival benefit by lowering phosphorus if his bank balance goes out and he dies otherwise you stop dialysis if he's on yeah. dialysis yeah so he'll dialysis. die otherwise yeah exactly <laughs> yeah okay so we move to the next uh, Let's finish this uh, order and then uh, Prashant, are you there? Prashant, hello. Sharad is. Sharad. Hello. Prashant is there. I see his name in the participants. I saw. Huh. Yado, yes sir. So have you contacted all of them? Are they there? Uh, yes sir, Doctor Prashant sir is there. Hmm. So, but why is he I not answering? I think he is not able. To... But he is. He is uh, probably sir. having his food. Is it? I can't see it. But uh... sir, I dare say drink. Ah, uh, maybe. Prashant. Sharad, I can see Sharad sir, but I think he is facing some problem with his mic. Okay, so let let let's finish off these questions uh, which I have already lined up uh, as a panel. So again, anybody from the panel who are already present can answer this. So, what do you think is the patient profile suitable for sucrophoric oxyhydroxide? We uh, somebody did mention that cost is an issue. Then this is going to definitely provide a cost benefit yeah. dr hemant mr yeah sharad you are there sharad yeah sharad please address yeah. you can read this question yes yes hemant i can can yeah. you listen yes yes please go ahead the question is what is the patient profile suitable for, for sfo sucrophoric oxyhydro yeah i think dr floyd has already said the criteria is uh, laid down in public the article published in nephron the post hoc analysis phase 3 study of head to head comparison of sevlamar with sfo showed that younger the patient more suitable for fso the more the bmi again uh, more for fso and uh, higher baseline serum phosphorus the faster reduction of phosphorus is achievable more with sucrophoric oxyhydroxide so younger age uh, higher bmi the higher baseline serum phosphorus is uh, the indication to use uh, upfront sucrophoric uh, ox uh, oxyhydroxide but in our day to day practice i mean we have seen that most of our ckd patients are diabetic and hypertensive elderly with low ejection fraction where the pill burden as dr floyd said is 19 plus three anti diabetics four anti hypertensives and uh, soda bicarb and other things the pill burden is so heavy with other uh, phosphorus binders i think the sucrophoric oxyhydroxide definitely scores because the pill burden is less potency is maximum 
and you are it's chewable. You don't have to swallow them with the fluid intake with the reduced ejection fraction. So these patient profiles would I would selectively use uh, sucrophilic oxyhydroxide. Thank you, thank you, Sharad. Uh, hold on, Sharad. In case uh, yes, yes, uh, you, maybe you can take the next question. And um, also, so Dr. Prakash Darji, if he's not there, you can address this. Is Dr. Prakash Darji there? No, you don't. So, Sharad, can you take this question also? That's what I uh, said. Yeah. The younger, high BMI, and high oh, no. base phosphorus. No, this this is I a little would, different I question. Would, initiate, I would initiate and switch and switch. Yes, yes. So these three category of patients, younger, the age, high BMR, high baseline phosphorus, probably I would prefer to initiate rather because the, uh, the dosage of other phosphorus binders required, pill burden is so heavy. And uh, obviously, as I said, the other existing uh, dialysis patients, wherein even after giving 4,800 of uh, Sevelamar carbonate, and three grams of lanthanum, or uh, as you enumerated in your case, very high dosage of 2,100 of calcium acetate. Even when the uh, phosphorus is not coming under control, obviously I would switch these patients or add on sucrophoric uh, oxide. So let's let's took the, take the another another situation. So say somebody is on uh, calcium acetate uh, uh, three tablets a day, okay, and his phosphorus is controlled. So now, because KDGO says that, no, you should not use calcium-based phosphate binder. So will that be an no, indication no. to switch Dr. over Hemant to Mata, I would go more with your opinion in mm. Indian scenario. Mm. I think uh, hypocalcemia also needs to be considered. Mm. And uh, if the calcium, corrected calcium is within normal range, mm. even after giving calcium acetate, I would prefer to continue with calcium acetate because mm -hmm. of the lower cost involved. Mm -hmm. Because this is a, a ongoing treatment and cost matters mm -hmm. so much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so let's go to the next question. Uh, is, uh, Prashant, are you there? Uh, sir, we contacted sir. Mm -hmm. uh, he is facing some technical issue. He has also got uh, technical. Yeah. What about yeah. Dr. Purva Parekh? Uh, sir, uh, she is unable to unmute. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, okay. Uh, Sonal Ben? Hello? Dr. Sonal Dalal is there? Yes, sir. She, she was there, but I think she has dropped. She has dropped. Okay. Anybody else? Amanda, I am I'm there. I am very much in Sharad. Yeah, yeah. But if somebody else wants to answer, otherwise you can. Tarun, are you there? Yeah, I am I very much here. Can you answer this question? How often do you need to transit yeah. to another phosphate binder? I mean, how difficult it is to control it with a reasonable pill burden and uh, most uh, or many times you feel, oh, no, I need something better and major problem, phosphorus is never controlled. Right. So it needs a complete assessment whether the patient is dietary compliant or not. And is he taking his I'm hearing too many noises. Yeah. So what I was saying is uh, we, you have to consider the uh, scenario whether the dietary restrictions are there or not, whether he's compliant or adherent to his previous phosphate binders or not, what is the pill burden. So we usually in diuresis patients do monthly tests. Mm -hmm. And if the monthly test shows that the phosphate is persistently more than five. Then the next month, I would try to translate it or add on, for example, sucrose oxyhydroxide mm. and see what is the phosphate trend. If it starts coming down, I can withdraw the other uh, uh, phosphate binder and continue with SFO. Mm. Or depending upon the phosphate level, I can decrease the dose of SFO as well. Uh, just to highlight here, many of our 25 out of 25, the data which I gave, many mm. of our patients are on twice SFO only with major meals. They are not mm. taking 1500 yeah. times three times a day. So that way also you can manage phosphate uh, binders. Dr. Apurva, I see you joining in. Are you there? Yes, sir. I am just joined, but uh, voice is this you. Mm -hmm. Voice is in. We can hear want you. Please, yeah. you want to answer the same question? No, it's, it's fine, sir. It's fine. Let's go. You want to yes, make sir, any, no. any other comment about uh, use of SFO in your practice? Yes, sir. Yes, yeah. my... 
we two minutes in two minutes, sir. Uh, yeah, please, sir. please. No, is I agree with completely agree with him. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So, no, you do you have any personal experience about using SFO? Mm, I think we have lost him. Yes, yes. Okay. Apurva? Okay. Is Prashant there? No, sir. No. So, since this question is after Mo Mohan, are yes. you there? Yes, sir. I am here. Yeah, so would you like to take this question? So iron-based phosphate binders, do they have offer advantage over currently available phosphate binders? And if you use iron-based phosphate binders, uh, how does SFO compare to ferric citrate in terms of phosphate binding and iron accumulation has been already addressed too. So between the two iron-based phosphate binder, which is a stronger phosphate binder and how do they compare with currently available? phosphate binders yeah uh, i think there are two phosphate binders one is a ferric citrate and the sfo for what we are discussing right now mm. so if we see the iron based phosphate binders uh, mm. they are quite efficacious the efficacy is uh, good uh, with both of them but if we compare the ferric citrate and sfo the accumulation effect is very much there is there in the uh, series which is published with the ferric citrate but uh, SFO, there is no accumulation of iron and the pill burden is less. The effectiveness is good at uh, all pH, it is effective. So if we compare both of the, uh, both of the iron-based uh, phosphate uh, binders, I think SFO is, uh, uh, is more outstanding as compared to the ferric citrate. So suppose SFO and FC have same kind of phosphate binding capacity. And then if I can use ferric citrate and because I don't have to then use IV iron, which I suppose all of our patients, almost 100% of our patients are on IV iron on hemodialysis. If we cut, I can cut the IV iron and just maintain their iron status also with a ferric citrate. How is that scenario? What do you see that there? But uh, some studies have shown about the- No, no, forget the, no, we are talking about our, our experience. Forget the study. Yeah, I, I personally don't have the experience with the ferric citrate, but mm. I have used the SFO. Mm. So, but I I think uh, giving the ferric citrate in patients, uh, uh, the uh, uh, iron absorption is there. So that will reduce the use of IV iron. But uh, uh, I, I think uh, those who have used the ferric citrate, I think he's better person to answer. Yeah. Mm. No, see, one thing we have to realize ferric citrate came and went out of fashion for whatever reason so any of the panelists who have used yes. it in the past yeah Haven't, uh, can Haven't, i talk yeah, yeah please please you Haven't. had uh, if you remember you had invited yeah. me to talk I, yes exactly yeah. exactly yeah and the biggest issue which i raised was aluminum toxicity yes. with and acidosis and, also Yes, it is revisiting the same problem what we faced with phosphorus binders earlier with mm -hmm. aluminum, aluminum containing binders. The citrate increases aluminum absorption tremendously, both paracellular and intracellular. And uh, there's a nice article showing uh, aluminum accumulation and toxicity, all that we had seen with aluminum uh, uh, binders. Yes. Uh -huh. So the biggest problem with uh, uh, ferric citrate is you have to give double the dose of SFO, six grams per day, and uh, there is tremendous uh, concern about aluminum accumulation and toxicity, and that's the reason this ferric citrate went uh, out of uh, yeah. went on the backstage. Yeah. Though, as you rightly said, it may obviate the need of intravenous iron in especially pre-diabetes patients because there is significant iron absorption, ferritin levels goes up, transferrin saturation also goes up. But there is a highest risk of uh, aluminum uh, toxicity because of increased aluminum absorption because of citrate. Yeah, which we probably did not know when that molecule was introduced in Indian market, but now we have become wiser, probably. Okay, thank you, Sharad. Uh, any any other panelists have any other uh, comments to make? I think cost effectivity of SFO also is there. 
uh, even if you give 500 milligram three times a day, it would cost 40 milligram, uh, 40 rupees per tablet, 120 rupees. Mm. And the lowest possible dose of Sevilamar, it would go to 240 plus. That's exactly, and it is not as efficacious in. Yes. Uh, yes. And, and uh, I would be very personally very skeptical to use it if serum calcium is less than eight because it can actually cause more hypocalcemia. Mm. So that's yeah, one more one one uh, question that. Still, uh, there, uh, in spite of using uh, an availability of uh, so many cal cal calcium and non-calcium based phosphate binders, mm. still there are some refractory cases. So, how uh, you are going to approach uh, these patients? Mm -hmm. who, uh, uh, there are refractory hyperphosphatemia. Whether mm. they will respond to this SFO or there may be some patients who do not respond. Is it that we need to increase the duration of dose of dialysis? Yeah, I mean, if you go for this, uh, both the daily dialysis studies uh, and nocturnal dialysis studies, they are reporting good control of phosphorus. So obviously, in fact, you need a phosphorus replacement. Exactly. Point. So yes, uh, I'll, I'll I'll give you an example currently which I'm facing. So this uh, elderly lady was started on dialysis with phosphorus of ten, and so she was put on both Sevelamar and SFO. And she got admitted, she had an herpes and then post herpetic she developed uh, encephalopathy and as happens in herpes, she had a frontoparietal bilateral infarct and she became unconscious and presuming that this is also uremic component, we started dialyzing her daily and within a week, phosphorus came down to 0.5. So we had to actually stop all the anti-phosphorus drugs and actually add uh, phosphorus supplement to now build up. This is just as of last three, four days. Let's see what. So yes, because she has been dialyzed daily. And this is again, we see something in an ICU situation on day to day basis, isn't it? This individual has children of age of 17 versus 20 years. Hello? Uh, Haman? Yeah. There is a question. Yeah. I posted me a management in, in is it individualized? Which is, differs from patient over age uh, 75 years over uh, as compared to 20 years. I think you have right, or said in your third uh, example, yeah. 30 years old lady. Obviously, mm. one would prefer uh, SFO. Mm. No, no. See, I'll tell you, it, it has to be. There's no one size shot fits all. I mean, guidelines exactly. are there for guidelines, but we have to be very practical in our approach and see uh, that we balance uh, all four compartments, uh, calcium, phosphorus, vitamin D, and PTH. So we cannot look at uh, phosphorus as only phosphorus or phosphorus as FTG uh, 23 or something like that. We cannot look at it individually. This is my personal feeling. All four parameters have to be monitored, whether you do PTH every six months, whether you do vitamin D every three months or six months, that is individualized. But we have to move ahead with all four parameters taken together and decide which uh, phosphate binder then suits that particular individual in the best possible way. But Dr. Hemant Mehta, I would totally agree with you. In the earlier stages of CKD stage three hmm. or even four, hmm. uh, hypocalcemia dictates probably mm. calcium-based phosphorus binders mm. may be preferable in CKD mm. stage 3 mm. in the earlier stages over non-calcium-based binders exactly. because of the additional benefit of correcting hypocalcemia. Mm -hmm. You have raised this point very much. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, any other com question or comments? Uh, Heman, bhai. Yeah. Uh, any uh, experience in managing calciphylaxis patient? Uh, yes, I had had two patients, uh, but, uh, you know, not much improved. We lost both of them. Okay. So, because it's very severe, uh, you know, painful, ulcerative lesions, making the patient's life very miserable. So, yeah. you know, we could actually not do anything for both of them. Okay. So, that. Prashant, are you there? Dr. No, Prashant, sir, he's not there. He's not there. Uh, okay, he wanted yeah, sir, to... Yes, sir, he tried. He tried. Hmm. To... He's not able to connect. Uh, not even through his mobile. He can connect audio There's through his mobile. There's some internet uh, issue at his place. Uh, but mobile should... Okay, fine. 
so okay if there are no more questions or comments let's conclude this uh, panel discussion and i would like to give you the summary of sfo in ckd so it's an oral iron based phosphate binder with a practically insoluble active moiety which is polynuclear iron 3 oxyhydroxide it's non inferior efficacy to sevelamer carbonate in lowering ferrin phosphorus levels so that has been proven significantly more effective in maintaining controlled serum phosphorus levels with maintenance dose than with low dose so numerically lower pill burden better treatment adherence than sevelamer carbonate generally well tolerated the side effect profile was already described by dr floy uh, uh, with similar long term tolerability tolerability profile to sevelamer carbonate we will have to see because we don't have any long term tolerability experience as such and as uh, it was proven in the previous studies that minimal ion absorption with no evidence of ion accumulation over 52 weeks this is what has been shown in the trial again we will have to have our own experience uh, uh, study the ion uh, levels uh, over a period of time to come up with uh, our answer as to whether the sentence is true or false so with that uh, i thank all the participants the panelists and the audience and also the company sponsoring this uh, event uh, thank you very much and have a good thank day. you thank you dr ahmed mehta yeah. Thank, thank, you. You. Thank, you. thank you thank you thank you thank you sir thank you. on uh, behalf of mqr team i would like to thank uh, Uh, Himant Mehta sir for moderating this session uh, so brilliantly, and to all the esteemed panelists, Dr. Sarat Chit sir, Tarun Joloka sir, Dr. Himal Shah sir, Dr. Mohan Patel. Unfortunately, Dr. Prakash Dalji could not join due to some emergency. Uh, Dr. Apurva Parekh, Dr. Sanal Dalal, Dr. Prashant Rajput, and Dr. Ashwini Kumar Khandekar. Sir, uh, we are highly obliged by your presence, and uh, I'm sure like. uh you know we uh, all were enlightened with this panel discussion and i would also like to thank our uh, speakers uh, for today dr jogan floyer and uh, our uh, chairperson dr vijay kher thank you so much uh, himan mantha sir once again from the uh, entire mqr team and uh, we would like to have uh, such sessions once again thank you thank you thank you very much yeah thank bye you. bye yeah thank you thank you